You are watching Finding Our Talk. Vous regardez parler pour survivre. Because of the nick and the fool. Chita one, the Uncle Wana. Legs and the tennis pile. Hi, and welcome once again to Finding Our Talk. I'm your host, Paul Chaput. The role of language and culture is key to the survival of traditional ways in all Aboriginal communities. Today we'll visit the Gwich'in of the Yukon and learn about the challenges they face to keep their language and culture alive in today's world. North of the Arctic Circle, along the shores of the Porcupine River and the Yukon, is the community of Old Crow. Its members speak Gwich'in, which is part of the Athapaskan language group. The Gwich'in are also known as the Vuntut Gwich'in. It's early morning, and Jane Montgomery, a Gwich'in language teacher, has her language class out on the land in order to teach about the use of traditional medicine. Lana, you have to look on the trees. There's it from around. I wanted to be a language teacher because I think it's important to preserve our language. Where's your plastic bag? There's a lot of young people in the community here can understand the language, but they're not speaking it. What's in your hat? How do you say that in Kuchin? And Liti Maskit. Liti Maskit. Some of them have hard time speaking the language because from the time they were kindergarten, it was always flashcards, flashcards, and no hands on. So, what I'm trying to do now is do a lot of hands on things, activity with them. This is called Juniper, and in Kuchin, they call it Betrukjak. And it's used for many things, stomach, um, upset stomach, sinus, uh, problem. sinus problems. This week we're studying plants that we use for medicinal use. And we're, what we're doing today is um, picking plants. And then tomorrow we have three elders coming to class and they're going to show the students how to make medicine. The young people can understand it. I hear some of them speak it. I speak to them, and they respond in which in, but they're not using it as much. Um, Seventy years old and up are all they're fluent. You've got to put the bottle in place. Mm -hmm. That will use it. Even one match or something, anything no. you put, yeah. leave it there. Their first language was Gwich'in. Um, young people my age can understand it, but they're not speaking it. Take it a tree, tie it to you, one current, then choose your cure, great teeth, a kikihi. As you can know, one trick or the kikihi, a hot and tight. A coat of take it in trick, a red in and cut. This is Aive, Grey Willow, Aive. This is the Van Tatkuch in Ginjik Noun Dictionary. And these are some words and caribou parts. The lungs is chitritok, chitritok. The eye, chinde. At the moment, we're documenting the language. I'm working on a verb book, which is, I think, really important because we have a few handful of elders left, and we want to document the language as much as possible. This spring, we took elders out on the land up the Crow River. 
and we videoed and taped the elders on the land. As part of this oral history project, the community is also planning to develop curriculum material on Christian history, culture, and language for use in the school. Our elders help us understand who we are as a people. One of our priorities in the Natural Resources Department is to document all our stories for the younger generation. Some of the elders haven't seen these places in 50, 40 years, so it was quite emotional for some of the elders. Taking them out to these places that we've only heard stories from, from themselves, it brings them alive and they actually give more information than they would be in town during an interview. Mary Jane Moses is a translator for the Oral History Project. It's really important to keep our language alive and to know the ways and the culture of our Gujin people for the young people for the future. We put those videos into our language and in that way the elders can understand, understand the message that we're trying to bring to the rest of the world. The one that I worked on was on caribou and our way of life surrounding the caribou. For thousands of years, the Gwich'in and the caribou have lived in symbiosis. One feeds and the other protects. Randall Tetlici is a Gwich'in hunter who still knows many of the traditional songs that express this unique relationship with the caribou. This song is about the chief grandfather caribou, he lives north of here, about 100 miles, he lives in the mountain. This is where the chief grandfather caribou sit. And what the chief grandfather caribou is telling the caribou is to go travel and feed the community, clothe the community, and comfort the community. It's very important to speak our language because our language is part of our relationship with the caribou because the caribou understand our language and the caribou understand the land and we understand the land. The caribou songs is done in our language, so when we do sing the caribou song, the caribou can hear that and they can listen to it. Sometimes when you sing for the caribou, they come. This river, we call it Chotanjik. Translated, it's called Quill River, but at some point, it became Porcupine River. William Josie is deputy chief of the Buntut Gwich'in. He helps manage the porcupine caribou herd. The porcupine caribou herd is very important to our people. We've been living with it for thousands of years. Our legends and our history is centered around it. In the past, when our people were nomadic, we followed the caribou all season. We follow them north in the springtime, and we follow them south in the wintertime. And now that we're centered around a community, we're right in the middle of their crossing the river. In the last hunt, we went 70 miles up the river. We usually uh, set camp, leave most of our gear there. And then we just wait at driftwood and uh, just had to be patient. This spot is one of the main crossing areas for the porcupine herd. Driftwood River comes from the north and it's sort of like a, a straight line north. And on both sides there's this braided trail both sides down the river and that's just like a highway for the caribou. They use that as a guide I think to come down. And every year they cross here. Vuntat Gwich'in still manage the caribou herds as they've always done. Even to this day, 
They are official co-managers with government as part of their self-government agreement signed in 1995. The Yukon is the only jurisdiction in Canada that government share wildlife management with Indians, so we work closely with, with the Yukon government in, in managing and preserving our, our wildlife resources. Bantan Kuchin citizens can hunt any fish or wildlife in our traditional territory as long as we eat it for food. There's only three situations where government can limit us, and that's for conservation, uh, public health, and public safety, which is understandable. I didn't go after that cow. She had twin calves, and that's, that's very rare. It's, uh, not very often we see a cow with twin calves. And some elders uh, go after cows with no calves, dry cow, we call them because the meat's much tender and, and it's just as fat, but it's much tender. But I like to go after the, the big fat bull and uh, give those uh, two little calves a chance to grow up and produce more little caribou's. Today, the porcupine herd is one of the last great herds found in North America. Every year, the caribou migrate from their wintering grounds in the Yukon to their calving grounds in Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Plans to open the refuge to exploration by oil companies are now before the U.S. government. Norma Cassie has spent the last 17 years fighting for the protection of the caribou herd and the Vuntut Gwich'in way of life. If they develop that area, it's going to be massive destruction to the Arctic ecosystem because 95% of the Arctic is already open for oil and gas. This place is very, very special. 40,000 calves are born every June 6th there. 145 species of migratory birds come from all over the world to uh, have their young ones. You know, this is Nichin Kwan, Vitsaheti Kwan, Laju, Ajukwan. You know, they shouldn't bother that place. Raising public awareness about the Gwich'in way of life is essential. Sandra Newman lectures all over North America with the help of organizations such as the Sierra Club. I don't really explain myself as a lobbyist. Um, the way we like to look at it is, is that we are educating the people in the United States and the world about how we survive up here as a people and a culture. I let them know that my people have been living here approximately 30,000 years and that um, there's never been a time that we know of where Gwich'in people, Vantat Gwich'in people and the caribou have not had a relationship together. Um, I let them know that our relationship is based on <clears throat> the caribou providing for us spirituality and food and clothing, medicine, tools, and in return we take care, of, take care of the land for the caribou so that our children in the future can also have fresh food to eat, food as in caribou and the animals and clean water to drink. We spend a lot of money every year in sending our people down to the states and around in Canada to, to make people aware of our culture and how important caribou it is to us and, uh, and in our efforts to, to protect the calving ground. In the last few years, we, we got film crews and <clears throat> from Japan, Germany, all over America, and, and even such papers as Washington Post. We use any type of... Um, resource that's available to us to educate the people of the world about how we live up here and about our relationship to the caribou. We have a website and we've gotten comments from France, Germany, England about how they've seen our website and how they've enjoyed our website and they want to know more about our culture. Okay, 
I know the power of big industry, you know, they got lots of money and a lot of bright people behind them and they usually get what they want, but we're going to fight, fight till the end to keep this what we have. It's a lot of work, it's uh, hard work, but we have the support of our people behind us and we have the spiritual energy coming from our elders at all times. We phone them up sometimes and you know, many times over the years, I phone the elders up and I say, you know, I talk to them in my language and I say, you know, it's getting hard. I'm getting lonesome for my family. I get lonesome for my people, but we have to do it. We have to continue. This is our way of life. Our whole way of life as Kuchin people is in jeopardy right now. If they develop the calving grounds of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, this would destroy my people. This would be the beginning of a cultural genocide of my people. It's not about the oil. It's not about the huge oil companies going on to land and drilling for oil. We are quite aware that the world needs oil, and especially the United States, and their overuse of all their resources. However, the issue for us is the preservation of our culture. It's scary to think that people from southern United States have almost control over your destiny and your culture as a people in the north, and we are not even from the United States. We live in Canada. However, the caribou herd that we have a relationship with give birth in the United States. I often, in my travels, think of the Plains people and their loss of the buffalo. And I can feel the pain that they went through and the loss and the, the agony that they, they have, that they had to go through in losing a spiritual connection with an animal and a whole culture. To dry this meat for winter use, we live on dry meat. We have dry meat all the time. We have, we use a, uh, marrow bones and we make bone grease and we make a uh, caribou skin mattress and this is what we take when we go hunting whether it's in the fall or in the summer doesn't matter what time of the year and this is what we sleep on we make games with hoofs and we smoke meat and everything we use the whole caribou The importance of elders among the Vuntut Gwich'in is crucial in the preservation of their culture and the caribou in the face of serious encroachment from the outside world. Over the years, Edith Josie has had her share of being in front of the cameras to voice her concerns. She the deep picture I see in the door. I cut to Gunta with the nuts from Hattini. She said, She picked her Gunti against it great or so easy. I tell them my name is Edith Jose and, and I also write the news from Old Crow and People know me all over the place and they respect me. And now these people here, they, I cut, cut the rump and they, they take my picture. And I was really glad for that when people do that and they, they respect me, I, they really give me strength and a strong faith. Mm. That's what I say. <laughs> Even as such big issues loom over the Bunt at Gwich'in, they still take care of issues close to home. With its connection to culture and the caribou, language is at the heart of their being.
our language ties in with our culture and that's where our identity and a lot of our teachings and our spiritual connection with the earth and the animals come from is from the language and that's something that we're that I specifically am always being challenged with because it's so hard for me to hear it. It's I've been like that all my life. Our culture is part of who we are and language is part of it. And without the language, I don't think we have a culture. And when we're in the classroom, we use the language a lot, but it's up to the parents at home to speak to them in order for them to speak the language fluently. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. This is my home, and it's a place where our ancestors roam, where they continue to live, where their spirits continue to live. It's an obligation on my part to fight for this land, to safeguard it, because um, the, the animals that we live with can't speak for themselves, you know. Um, we have to do that in our country, and that's, uh, that was, a, I guess, a promise that I made to my grandfather years and years ago when I was quite small. We have a lot to offer to the world. In fact, I believe that in the future, Bantat Gujin people will help the world tremendously. We have saved so much of our earth and our culture. We like your comments on our program and any suggestions you might have for future episodes. Just drop us a line or visit our website. Join us again next week for more language adventures on Finding Our Talk. 